Australians are said to eat 60 grams of it every single day, and in wealthy countries, it accounts for a sixth of our total calories consumed. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the white, sweet stuff on my table. That's right, sugar. In today's episode of Dr. Nora, I'm going to be sharing with you how much, if any, sugar we should be consuming and what impact it has on our health. So sit back, relax, and enjoy dinner with Dr. Nora. First up, let's talk about recommendations. Now, whilst there are no real strict guidelines in Australia of how much sugar we should be consuming on a daily basis, the bigger organizations out there in the world, such as the World Health Organization, have said that we should be consuming no more than 10% of our total calories per day in the form of sugar. So that means if you consume a total of 2000 calories per day, you should be having no more than 200 calories of sugar each day. And what does this translate into? Well, let's take a look. For women, it roughly translates into six teaspoons of sugar, as you can see here, does look quite a lot, doesn't it? And for men, around nine teaspoons of sugar. Now I know you're thinking, gosh, Dr. Norrit, that is so much sugar. I don't think I have any of that. No way, Jose. Well, join me very shortly because I'll be going through nutritional labels on food to let you know exactly where those hidden sugars are and how you can find out how much you're actually consuming yourself. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty, we really need to understand what sugars are. Sugars are a form of a carbohydrate. Now, carbohydrates are a food group within our diet. As you will know, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, etc. There are two forms of carbohydrates out there, the digestible ones and the indigestible ones. Indigestible carbohydrates go through your body completely unchanged, and they're often referred to as roughage or fiber. Now, these go on to make up primarily things like cotton and paper. Pretty cool, right? Then we talk about digestible carbohydrates, and these are the sugars which are digestible, and there are a few of them. First up, you would have heard of glucose. Glucose is found in fruit and vegetables, and it gives energy to plants and animals. Next up, we can talk about fructose. Fructose you may have heard of, and we find that in our fruit, naturally occurring sugars. Then we move on to galactose. Galactose is primarily found in the animal kingdom, and it forms part of a milk sugar. Moving on from there, we've got maltose. Maltose is produced during the digestion of starch. And then we've got lactose, which some of you may have heard of. Lactose is found in dairy products such as milk and yogurts. Now, those of you out there who may have a lactose intolerance will know that those of you that eat a little bit of lactose sugar will actually develop things like diarrhea. And certainly there are some populations out there that can't digest lactose very well. And then finally, we've got sucrose, which is the chemical name for this beautiful substance here on my table, sugar. Now, sugar is made up of fructose and galactose together, and it's thought that the fructose part of the sugar is actually the part that causes all the undesirable health effects. Okay, Dr. Nora, I know there's a whole load of different sugars now, but what does that mean for me? Well, most of the foods that we eat produce glucose. Now, glucose is one of those sugars that we spoke about a little bit earlier that gives us energy. But what happens when we have glucose in our diet? Well, our body responds to an input of glucose by causing our pancreas, which is one of the organs in our body, to produce insulin. Now, the reason it does that is because it wants to reduce the amount of sugar in our bloodstream. We all have a certain amount of sugar in our bloodstream, and usually this will be a nice, normal, steady level. So when we eat something sweet or we eat some food, our sugar levels go up naturally. And so our body wants to counteract this by producing a hormone or a chemical known as insulin that brings that sugar back down to normal again. If we're not needing to use that energy or that glucose straight away, then what happens is that glucose that was you know, hovering around for us to use for, say, running around or fighting some animal or something like that actually gets converted into another chemical called glycogen, and that then gets stored into our liver and our muscle cells for storage for later. But the problem is, is if you have a large amount of glucose for a prolonged period of time, is that your liver will take that sugar and because it doesn't have any more storage space for it within the liver cells, it takes it and it converts it into a fatty acid and then it deposits it into the liver and other cells as well. And the net impact of that is that we end up with conditions such as non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And this is where essentially the liver becomes very fatty. And if you can catch it in time, you can reverse it with some lifestyle changes and say some weight loss. However, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is becoming one of the primary causes for liver disease in Australia. So it's becoming a really big problem. And if we were to leave it untreated, for example, if you carried on eating lots of bad foods and not doing any exercise, then what happens is unfortunately those cells within the liver are no longer able to regenerate and they end up becoming scarred, leading to a condition known as cirrhosis, which can have some detrimental impact onto your physical health. Now, from my perspective as a general practitioner, I have actually seen an increasing amount of patients who are presenting to me with seemingly healthy patients, but when we look at their blood work, their liver function is askew and things just don't look right. 
And what we do as general practitioners, we try to find out why is it that the liver is not working very well. And so often we'll send them through for an ultrasound scan to have a look and see why they have deranged liver. And very often we'll see that the liver has become fatty or it's got fatty infiltration because they have too much sugar or too much glucose over a prolonged period of time that there's just simply an excess of glucose in their body. And so it's getting stored as fat cells instead. Now the good news is a lot of patients of mine who have this sort of shock if you like often go on to a really healthy lifestyle. They will go and do exercise, they will go and eat some healthy foods and generally within a couple of months, say three or maybe even six months, will often see an improvement of their liver function tests and even a reversal of their fatty liver. So it is really important to bear in mind that even if you look nice and slim, things may not be 100% great inside with your internal organs. Okay, so we've spoken about the impact of an excess glucose running around in your system and causing your liver to become fatty, but what other impacts are there of having, say, lots of sugar in your diet? Well, I recently read a book, actually, I read it twice because it was so good, um, Pure White and Deadly, which is a book by John Rudkin. And this is a scientist who has performed plenty of um, case studies uh, in his life and also his predecessors as well. And he writes all of his clinical findings within this book. It is a bit of a heavy book to read, but I will hopefully summarize some of his findings with you today. But if you do want to read it and you are interested in it, I would thoroughly recommend it. It has got a lot more information about the impacts of sugar on our health and on our life as well. But within the book, it does actually tell you that eating sugar actually not only changes you know, the liver and so on, but it actually also has an impact on your cardiovascular health, which means your heart health. And what does it mean? So when people consume sugar, we know that from the studies that were in this book, that actually having sugar in your diet, sucrose, for example, actually changes the cholesterol makeup in your body. And so what that means is that it actually increases the amount of triglycerides. Now, triglycerides are one of the fats that is roaming around in your body, which as you can expect, is not very good to have a fat roaming around in your body. But we also have good fats as well, and good fats help to protect our heart from any kind of nasties, such as um, heart attacks and so on. But what sugar does to our cholesterol is it actually increases the bad fats, the triglycerides, and it decreases the good fats. And not only does it change the cholesterol makeup, but it also changes the behavior of some of the red cells within the blood as well. So we all have a blood cell in our blood called platelets. And so what they found in the book is that sugar actually makes your platelets a bit more sticky and it makes them more susceptible to clotting. So you can imagine the combination of your bad fats going up, your good fats going down, plus the stickiness of your platelets actually increases your risk of having things like atheromas, which are basically plaques that form around your arteries and then eventually become hardened and essentially what will happen is you get some narrowing of the diameter of your artery. And so all it really takes is a bit of a spasm or a contraction and you may end up with a heart attack. Now, I'm not saying that sugar is the sole reason for cardiovascular disease. Of course, there are multiple other factors involved, such as genetics. Unfortunately, we do know that those with a family history will likely to have more cardiovascular illnesses. We also know that those who smoke or drink lots of alcohol or don't do much exercise and have a sedentary lifestyle are also at risk of having cardiovascular diseases. But if it's something that we can change in our diet, for example, our sugar consumption, why not take heed and hopefully lead a healthier and happier life? Another interesting impact that sugar has on our bloodstream is, as demonstrated by the experiment within this book, is it actually changes our glucose tolerance. So a study was performed within the book and participants were given two weeks worth of a high sugar diet every single day. And what they actually found was that in those participants, their glucose tolerance decreased. So what do I mean by that? Well, as we said earlier, we have a baseline level of sugar within our system and that should be corrected each time we eat food. However, with those who had a sugar diet or a high sugar diet over a prolonged period of time, actually their body was unable to make those adjustments. And so it led for them to having a higher baseline sugar level than say they would have two weeks prior to starting the diet. But the good news is, is that once those participants stopped having that high sugar diet, within about two, three weeks, their glucose tolerance went back to their normal baseline again. So it just goes to show, even by changing a diet, and whether it's been a diet that you've had for a very long time, if you make a change now, you'll certainly have an improvement to your health. Now, the really interesting impact that sugar has on our health is acid reflux. Now, you might be thinking, acid reflux, I get that when I eat some really, you know, heavy meals, I eat some cheese, I might have some alcohol, 
that's when I get acid reflux. Yes, and certainly those certainly are foods that will trigger it and participate in causing you those really uncomfortable um, symptoms that you might have to reach over and get some antacids for. But just like those participants within the study that had a high sugar diet for a period of two weeks had a reduced glucose tolerance, those same participants actually had an increase in acid reflux. And the reason this was is because their bodies were producing more acid and their digestive systems were in overdrive, so they're producing lots more juices as well. And so this contributed to an impact of having acid reflux in their esophagus or their food pipe. Now, not only does sugar have an impact on our heart, our liver, our glucose tolerance, our acid reflux abilities, but it also, of course, naturally impacts our teeth. And so those of you out there who may have had a high sugar diet may have also experienced some dental caries and needing a trip to the dentist every so often. So I know you're thinking, Dr. Nora, this has been a a really interesting informative dinner. Should I even be eating sugar? Well, that is up for you to decide. Generally speaking, as per the recommendations, we really need to be careful of how much we're consuming in our day-to-day -day life. Let's take, for example, a jar of tandoori paste shawards. It's really important that when you're in the supermarket, you have a look at the back of the nutritional label and you see how much sugar is actually being consumed within your day-to-day -day life. So, for example, per serving, there are 0.7 grams of sugar. So there's just under a gram of sugar in this pot per serving. That's not very much. But let's take a look at this Nando's medium peri-peri sauce. Oh, I love a bit of Nando's peri-peri sauce. But per serving, the amount of sugar is 1.5 grams. So we can see easily that we're stacking up quite quickly. And now what about these lovely coconut flakes that, I'll be honest with you, I put these on my porridge every single day because it just tastes so lovely. Well, let's take a look at the dietary nutritional label again on the back. There are two grams of sugar for every 30 grams serving. So you can see quite easily how this stacks up. So already in my porridge, I've got about two grams of sugar. In my dinner, I might have another one and a half grams of sugar let alone all of the fruits that I could be eating and even those little naughty snacks when we have when we have a biscuit or a cookie throughout the day. You can easily go up to your six or maybe more teaspoons of sugar a day. Not only is it important to look out for how much sugar you're having in your diet, but it's also really important to lead a healthy, balanced lifestyle. Now this does mean having a good amount of fruit and vegetables in your diet, along with some protein and watching the amount of sugar that you have within your food. Of course, it's also really important to watch how much alcohol you're consuming and how much exercise you're performing as well. Now this should always be taken on the recommendation of your doctor, but generally speaking, having about 30 minutes of exercise, say five days a week, making you slightly out of breath is a general good recommendation. And of course, if you're a smoker, it's super important to think about breaking that cigarette in half and stopping today. So whether you have it or not, I'd love to know in the comment section below. But for now, take care and stay healthy. Woo, it's a wrap, 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 it's a wrap. Finished. Where's my sugar? I need a sugar high. No.